Good morning and good evening. Today we're talking to Orlando from StackerDAO Lab. This conversation is brought to you by Stacks Ventures. If you're an investor, please message Orlando for an invite to demo day. StackerDAO Labs is unleashing the ownership economy, no code platform, dev tools, and legal tech to build and manage Bitcoin DAOs via Stacks. Orlando, how are you doing today, my friend? Uh, pretty awful. No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm doing pretty well, man. Uh, you know, working a ton. We're uh, launching uh, pretty soon, so obviously, kind of just sprinting to the, towards the finish line. We have, like you mentioned, we have demo days coming up soon. Um, so just pretty busy, but uh, you know, no complaints. Things are going well. That busy is always good. How about you? When is launch? Great question. We can't say yet, um, but it's very soon. It'll be in June. Um, we, we had a delay just because um, with our launch partner, we ended up implementing kind of like a different structure. And so we had to like create new contracts, run our contracts, you a little bit of like revise our interface a bit. And we wanted also like some devs to review that, that those smart contracts. Um, so that kind of like delayed things a bit, uh, but it's the different, the, the add on that we're adding, I think is pretty cool. It's brand new in the community. And I don't think people, no one really knows about it yet. Um, so it'll be a pretty cool feature that um, I think a lot of people will like. Um, and I actually think a lot of DAOs in the future will probably end up taking up this similar um, like kind of like addition or feature that we ended up implementing. So, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it is a delay and I probably would have liked to have launched earlier, but I think it, it'll end up being worth it. I feel fortunate. A, a lot of people don't know, but Drew created this DAO working group back in 2021. You were a part of it. And then you created Stacker Dow Labs. Chris was there. He created Console Dow. I was there, and that gave me the the impetus and the ideas for uh, what is Zero Authority Dow today. Can you tell us about like those early conversations and what led you to build Stacker Dow? Yeah. Um, so so we actually the idea for this actually started in October. So me and my co-founder Ryan Waits had been well. No. So actually. Um, he had kind of randomly just DM'd me um, because he saw something that I was saying in a City Coins Discord channel, um, and we ended up start. We ended up talking about potentially launching an NFT project, um, and this was before any project had launched with like with Mint with Miami Coin. So the idea was going to be that we would mint this project using Miami Coin, and then all the holders of the NFT project would kind of like manage those funds from the product. All the funds would go to this, this the community, they would manage those funds. Um, and then they would send the funds um, to like some kind of like, like, like local Miami causes um, and potentially have this like, you know, like perpetual fund because you're like managing, earning yield and you can just like, you know, and you'd be able to donate it to the different Miami causes. So basically the idea was to have like, to have, to create real world use cases for Miami coin um, and kind of show how, Miami Coin can make a real world impact in the city of Miami. Um, so basically, you want to form a DAO, right? And we quickly realized that there was just no DAO infrastructure on Stack. There was no real way to do so. And we didn't want to have to do it ourselves, right? Like, think about it. If we had this NFT project and there are royalties, like, am I have to? Am I going to have to like basically manage the royalties for the rest of my life? Like, we didn't want that. We wanted, you know, it's this is crypto. This is Web three things should be automated. And we kind of wanted this, we wanted to create like, we wanted some DAO infrastructure that would kind of just manage this without us necessarily having to even be involved. Um, or at least not that involved in like managing the funds and the community could just like vote on chain and do so. Um, but obviously none of that was built. And so we had quickly, the, you know, we quickly realized that there was just no way we can build that infrastructure for an NFT project. But then we were like, wait a minute, um, we know other projects kind of want or their NFT projects want to manage a community. And, you know, we can see other ecosystems, how DAOs have kind of proliferated. Um, and we know, we, we believe obviously that Stacks would end up being a success and grow. And so we knew that DAOs would become Stacks. So then we were like, why don't we just do that and build DAO infrastructure? Um, and then we, that, that's kind of how the idea started. And then since I'm a lawyer, um, one thing I quickly realized that there were these very difficult and tough legal issues uh, and it kind of, frankly, kind of freaked me out. Uh, and then I realized, okay, well, hold on. If I'm a lawyer and I think this is hard, imagine anyone else who's like, who's not a lawyer and trying to try to form a DAO, right? So that's kind of how also like the legal tech side of things came to be. Um, and so now what we're building is a one-stop shop where people can form 
um, and manage legally compliant DAOs. Uh, the legal tech side of things will be will be optional. So you can use your own lawyer, or if you know you don't, you just don't want to deal with that. Um, you know, I would probably suggest otherwise. But you, you can do so, right? And we've, we're creating great infrastructure, smart contract infrastructure, smart contract infrastructure, um, and a great UI for people to be able to to launch and mat and operate their their DAO, both from with respect to like governance to make proposals, treasury management, voting, etc. What are the educational hurdles to if if people want to start their own DAO? Obviously, today there's a lot of a lot of uh, research that you have to do around the legal setups or or even like if you're starting with your own community, what do you want the mission values to be? How will Stacker DAO solve that problem as far as just the setup once a, a DAO wants to get going? Or I guess like receive some kind of education about starting their own DAO. It, frankly, it's pretty tough. Uh, and the reason for that, and this is probably one of the first things you realize when you are like working in DAO infrastructure or trying to develop any sort of DAO infrastructure is DAOs vary so widely. Um, and that's what makes things so difficult because depending on what you're doing and what your use case is, that's going to affect kind of like what the optimal tooling and infrastructure is for your DAO, as well as in terms of like le legal compliance stuff, like what is like the optimal legal kind of like arrangements or uh, arrangement for yourself. Um, and so that's what makes things very hard is that because they range so widely, it's not like I can just go to a place and be like, all right, how do I set up a DAO? Um, you're probably not going to get a good answer because it's not, it's probably not going to be specifically applied to you. Um, so because of that, and I mean, this, you know, this, this doesn't, obviously this, is, this doesn't scale well. So at some point we're either going to have to hire some people or just create a lot of good con oh, and or create a lot of good content for education. But what we've been doing now, since obviously we're smaller and the stack ecosystem is really just starting and DAOs on stacks are really just kind of kicking off. Frankly, I've just been talking to every project personally. Um, so I spoke at this point, I've spoken to about 60 projects and I kind of have just been, and people come to me with different stuff, like they're, they're on different levels. So some people literally have like no idea what they're really doing. Um, like aren't really sure about that, but they just know they kind of want to start one because they're working on some kind of web three project. Um, and then I'll kind of will help them just like give them advice. as like the type of things that they should look out for, think about um, what are kind of like key things that people tend to forget when they're thinking about that. So like one key thing um, is, you know, if you're not issuing your own token, uh, how are you going to fund your DAO? Because usually there are probably things that you want to do with your DAO that where you're going to deploy some funds. And so sometimes people don't really think about that aspect. That is actually pretty crucial because um, you may need a lot of capital for what you want to do, right? So um, help them kind of think about like just potential pain points that people don't really think about. And then once they get to the point where they kind of have an idea of what they want to do, we'll get into more specifics as to like how that structure looks like and what's kind of a optimal structure for that specific use case. Um, and again, like obviously it's up to the, whatever the founders want to do. So I, I tend to like just go over like what are the different trade, what are the different trade-offs for different structures, right? Um, because at the end of the day, like there, it's hard to, there, there is no like best structure, right? There isn't like, best, yeah, there's, there is no like best structure for that. It really just depends on its use case. Um, and each structure has its own trade-offs. Uh, so typically I'll like talk to them about like what are the trade-offs and kind of what would make sense and what trade-offs make sense given their particular use case and how they're structuring their specific project. Um, and then kind of once they kind of figured out kind of exactly what the structure is, then we'll talk about really get into like the nitty gritty as the actual kind of like the actual implementation details. And here we're talking about more like smart contracts kind of like what your interface may look like, um, et cetera. And we're kind of starting off this way, but eventually um, we're right now we're starting off in a private beta Launching in a few weeks, we'll launch several DAOs, like five to eight in June, um, and continue launching DAOs throughout the summer. Um, but for the private beta, you just need to kind of reach out to us. I'm, I'm available on Twitter um, or on, on Discord. You can also go to the Sacredale Labs Twitter and just DM us. Our DMs are open. Um, but then eventually we'll, we'll launch, we'll open to the public completely. Um, and there we'll have these like off the shelf templates. So basically, these structures are already made for certain types of use cases, but uh, we are also providing kind of like white glove bespoke services. So um, if you want like a specific structure that's better fit for your use case, uh, we could build that for you, just come to us. Um, and this is especially pretty prominent or pretty common for like protocol DAOs because 
protocols need con protocol DAOs need contracts that can govern the underlying protocol. So those contracts kind of by definition need to be a little more customized. Um, and so we're working with several like protocols as well to eventually launch their DAO. Um, but that's kind of like how our process is kind of looking like now and how eventually it will evolve once we open up our, our platform in the future. What are the templates that you're seeing start to evolve? So we know NFT space is common. We know some GameFi. The protocol DAOs that you speak you speak of is probably related to DeFi, where there's a specific use case for protocols and they have a token per se and, and some type of governance in place already. W tell us about the, the kind of uh, templates that will be plug and play today, but then what are the fringe cases that you'll have to develop around? Yeah. So because we have this, also have this like legal tech focus, we're going to have some like legal like legal relate or like 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 legal related templates where basically due to what you're doing um you kind of need to like hit certain regulatory requirements or you may potentially violate securities laws or investment advisor laws um and so we're baking those requirements into the smart contracts for those templates um those include like investment DAOs as well as uh on-chain startups and then we're gonna have a kind of like a gen more like a generic template um, where if you want to launch an NFT community or um, ba basically either use like an already existing NFT or um, an existing fundable token um, to kind of create this very just like basic um, and like easy, easy, like easy going DAO, I would say. Um, and we're also partnering with um, eventually with, uh, with, with Gamma. So then you'll be able to on their launch pad, like when you want to launch, let's say if you want to launch an NFT collection on their launch pad and you also want to form a, a DAO, you you'll eventually be able to just like launch the NFT and then kind of go right into our generation flow um, and then be able to kind of launch launch your DAO based off of that NFT contract. Um, and then in terms of kind of the more fringe cases, uh, I've really seen like kind of everything come up. Uh, I've seen like different tiers of voting depending on what type of like if you have a certain type of NFT where like if you have like the lowest tier, you can vote on some some things, a middle tier on others, and then like the high, highest tier, you can vote on like everything. Um, I've seen people ask for um, where you have like NFT gated membership, right? Uh, or member, like if you have the NFT, you're a part of the DAO, but then voting power is determined by a fungible token. Um, and, and yeah, going back to the protocol DAOs, while yes, obviously like every DeFi project, every DeFi DAO is a, a protocol DAO. We've act I've actually seen more, at least the products that we're speaking to, more non-DeFi um, projects, which actually kind of makes me pretty excited because I've seen some pretty cool projects that are going to be coming down the pipeline. I can't really talk, I can't talk about them because they, they're, not, they're not public yet. Um, but some pretty cool protocols that are, you know, like th making like pretty cool uses of Web3 um, and, and just like Bitcoin in general. Um, so I'm like looking forward to that. Um, but I kind of, just to circle back a bit um, because like, I feel like what I'm saying, I'm, I'm kind of just drawing like a, a really wide range of DAOs here. Uh, and so someone might be asking like, how do you guys do that? Like, it seems like uh, it might take you guys forever to like, to do all these different structures. And so I kind of want to get into, if I, if you don't mind, like, I think it's just kind of how our protocol works. Um, so we've developed this oper this like um, protocol operating system, which we call StackerDAO. So that's what StackerDAO is. And so we're StackerDAO Labs, the startup developing Stacker, uh, the StackerDAO operating system. And so um, I don't know if, if, if any, if, if anyone here has seen Executor DAO, but Stacker DAO is actually a fork of Executor DAO, um, which was created by Marvin Jensen, who's a great dev in the ecosystem. He's done like a ton of things, and we we thought his initial kind of like approach was pretty genius. Um, and so we, we're using kind of the same approach, but with like a few slight differences, um, and have really kind of just run with it and kind of really built it out. Um, and so the way that Stacker DAO works, and the reason why we're able to kind of like do things. So basically with Sacker DAO, you can create like a multi-sig, right? Like a multi-sig DAO, just like a multi-sig. Uh, but you can also create like an NFT gated DAO. You can also create um, like a protocol DAO that manages underlying protocol contracts. Like literally you name it, basically we can do it. Um, the reason for that is Sacker DAO and Executor DAO, but Sacker DAO is optimized to be incredibly composable and modular. And the way it does this is, is it's through its kind of like formation. Um, and so the way it works is you have a core DAO contract um, and that core contract is literally 
pretty dumb and like a little useless. It doesn't do much, except uh, it does two things. It, uh, it calls other contracts uh, or proposals. So basically when you have a proposal passed, that's, the, that's like the address, that's the, the contract that is calling um, whatever the proposal is and executing the action. Um, and the other thing is that it keeps a list of what are called extensions or extension contracts um, of, of which extensions have been enabled, right? So the, DAO, the, the, the core contract is pretty simple. Um, and the, the reason for this, again, it's like, it's all about modularity. Um, so we're really, everything's just like a bunch of different Lego blocks. And so extensions are what gives a DAO its structure and also allows it or enables a DAO to do things. So for example, you then will have, so you have this DAO contract, you then have this, a treasury extension and that's the treasury. So the treasury and the DAO are actually two separate contracts, right? And then you'll have another extension, which would maybe be like the membership extension, right? And so there, if you want a multi-sig, then it can be a list of like whitelisted addresses, right? Or a contract that kind of like white can whitelist a bunch of addresses that then can govern the treasury, right? Or it can be a, a list of NFTs, or it can be a fungible token, et cetera. And then you'll have another extension which governs proposals and how people vote on those proposals and what are like the time rules, right? Like if you submit a proposal, how long does it take until people can vote and how long is the voting period over and what's quorum, things like that. So that's another extension, a proposal extension. So right now we have four different contracts that form this one DAO, right? And then um, for any action, it needs to enable the, an extension for those actions. So let's say if you want, um, you know, if you want to like basically interact with Alex, the DeFi protocol, you can then pat, you can then enable or like, and if, if the DAO is already up and going, um, you can do this by just submitting a proposal. Um, you can then enable an Alex extension that has basically a list of all the proposal proposals for um, any sort of like functionality in the Alex DeFi protocol. And once that extension is enabled, the DAO could then just basically execute any sort of um, Alex contract. If it wants to swap tokens, like once, once lending is up, like it, it wants to lend tokens, it can do so. So extensions, again, grant the DAO with, enables it to, to have some functionality and also create a structure. And because of that, because like all of these contracts are, or they're all like all these different parts are just different contracts. It allows uh, Stacker DAO to be extremely flexible and also it allows it to be able to be changed, right? So for example, if, let's say if you're starting a DeFi project, right? Um, but you're just a core team and like maybe you've raised some funds, et cetera. And you're kind of, or maybe you've already actually deployed your, con your, your contract, right? But you're not really ready yet for a full DAO. You can basically create with SAC or DAO like a multi-sig, right? But it had, and, and that's just a DAO contract, a treasury extension, and then kind of like the membership White uh, extension, and then once you're ready to deploy your full DAO, you can upgrade it to a protocol DAO because all all you have to do is then enable another membership extension for your token, right? Um, which would then allow the token holders to vote, disable the like what the like whitelisted address, which is basically the multi-sig part, um, and then enable another extension um, that will govern the underlying protocol contracts. Which gets to another point about Stacker DAO is that Stacker DAO can also own external contracts. So that core DAO contract can be the owner of external contracts, right? So this allows it to, again, for, for let's say, again, you have this protocol DAO, like a DeFi DAO, um, let's say Alex again. Let's say if Alex wants, let's say if there's an Alex DAO running and it's using Stacker DAO, um, if, if the Alex team were to transfer ownership of the contracts to, this, to the Alex DAO, right? Um, it can basically then pass a proposal to let's say let's say if it wants to um, disperse revenue to token holders, right? Uh, there'll be securities law issues there, but let's just say hypothetically, right? Um, it could then pass a proposal um, to actually implement that change in the Alex protocol um, because the DAO is now the owner of the protocol contracts, and then also if you think about it, it makes it extremely censorship resistant and decentralized because now. Literally, like there's not a single person, some founding team that is like running the contracts. And you find that if a lot of DeFi protocols, right? They're not actually like, they say they're DAOs, but they're not actually that decentralized because you have this centralized point of failure that being the founding team can kind of just do whatever they want, right? They can just like, 
change the protocol on a whim. Um, like a lot of DAOs tend to use multi-sig and, and snapshot, but you know, that arrangement isn't really decentralized because uh, you're really at the whims of the, of the DAO, of like the, the core team, right? Whoever's on that multi-sig can do whatever they want. Um, and so by having the DAO own like the protocol contracts, it's the community that's actually doing everything and governing everything. Um, and so that's kind of like the power of Stacker DAOs, right? Like, or stuff Stacker DAO, it can, it's amendable. The structure can change. You can upgrade like to certain different types of structures um, and it can own these different protocols. So that's how you can have a Stacker DAO that's a multi-sig or an NFT community or a protocol DAO that is literally like running this protocol and managing the protocol contracts. Um, and so that was, that was like very much in the weeds, but that's, um, kind of like in a very high level, how our smart contracts and how the Stacker DAO protocol works. Alex, uh, Go, the DeFi protocol, they're going to eventually have a, a fully decentralized model. So what if they were to use Stacker DAO to do that? Walk us through that example, if they were going to fully decentralize and the handover or through a, a, a proposal, submit the the contracts to the DAO for ownership. How how would that kind of work? Yeah, so I guess like one other aspect uh, about Stacker DAO that I didn't have is that um, all proposals are smart contracts. And what that means is that the DAO can execute it. So the, propo the proposals basically have um, initially some kind of logic for the, propo like for the proposal itself. And then underneath that, it'll have like the underlying logic of the proposal, right? So if it's a swap contract, right, to swap tokens, it'll have this like initial proposal logic. And then beneath that, um, the logic to like actually swap the contract. And so that's why every Stacker DAO has automatic proposal functionality. So once uh, a, proposal, a proposal is approved, any member can just execute um, um, the contract and then the DAO, and basically the DAO, that will basically tell the DAO to then uh, make that contract call. And so if it's a swap, could then like swap tokens for what, you know, whatever the proposal was. And so here, um, this is kind of, getting in the weeds and maybe about some things that I, I don't know exactly about like about the Alex DAO, but my understanding that they've, I think have deployed an executor DAO, um, which because like, again, second, I just a fork, like our contracts are for the most part, we're pretty sure pretty um, uh, composable with, 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 with executor DAO. And so what they can do is then deploy um, like an extension contract to basically, so right now I would imagine and it make, I'm making some assumptions here. I would imagine that they and probably we, have. We, we could just keep it general. We don't even have to talk about. Alex. Yeah. 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 No, but I think Alex is a good example, just to kind of have yeah. a specific example here, but I, I would imagine that they're probably, I want to, or I'm going to assume that if they're using this executor DAO, Lance, I know the core team is kind of running it right now. And so it's probably more like a multi-sig, right? And so what you can do there, kind of like what I was saying before is they, that core team could then pass this proposal, which is a smart contract, um, basically enabling um, um, like a, this, a different extension that would allow Alex token holders to now um, be the members with voting power of the DAO instead of like whitelisted addresses. And so they can pass that and also pass another extension um, that basically has like all these proposals that would... Um, basically manage the protocol. So it would include like all the protocol, like kind of like all the contracts that you would use to manage the protocol. And so they would just basically dis enable two extensions um, or those two extensions and disable their like, multi uh, I'm just gonna call it a multi-sig extension, disable their multi-sig extension. Um, and now you basically have a DAO that's controlled by Alex token holders and that can, um, well, and then they would have to transfer ownership of their of the Alex contracts to the DAO. So I guess that would be the final step. And then the, the, the DAO can also then like make changes in the protocol. For the examples where there is no fungible token, what is some of the setup that Stacker DAO would would enable a community to to provide there? Yeah. So there there are a few things you can do. Um, and I would say probably like probably most or like two thirds, maybe like over two thirds or three quarters of the projects we've spoken to aren't going to launch their own token. Um, so you can you can do a combination of things. You can um, use NFTs, um, and I think actually NFTs, in my opinion, are actually great for um, for governance tokens. Um, and it depends on the projects, right? But you can imagine there are certain use cases, certain projects where maybe 
you kind of want one token, one vote. So then the project can kind of just KYC themselves and just give people and um, and then like issue people their NFTs based off KYC um, and to kind of make sure that only one person is getting an NFT. Um, you can also make the NFT non-transferable, right? If you want, um, if you don't, if you don't want something to like to, to, to trade it because if you don't want membership to change because uh, maybe you specifically are granting that specific person membership. Um, so that's the NFT approach. You can also just whitelist addresses. Um, so like the member, you don't need a token, the members, like the members can just be specific addresses. Uh, additionally, um, you can whitelist addresses and then maybe do something like include an already existing fungible token uh, as like your voting lead. Um, so that way it's like this limited universe of people that can be a part of the DAO and then maybe like, so I think a good example for this might be something in city coins where maybe there's like this community project. And so they don't want just like anyone let's say if it's like a New York city coin project, right? Maybe they don't, they don't want anyone outside of New York city to kind of be in. So they kind of just are whitelisting addresses um, and KYC making sure that they're in, in NYC. Right. Um, and then maybe they're voting pass. So maybe you use those whitelisted addresses um, to kind of gate membership. And then you use um, maybe like NYC as a, as the, as actual the voting power. Um, and that way, if you have like more NYC, uh, you have more of a say in this stuff. Are there examples that don't use NFTs or tokens as a way to submit proposals and ratify those proposals? Yeah, so in that, so there you would just use white, like your ad, then you'd have to use your address. Um, so there you, you would just like whitelist addresses. Um, and that's kind of getting back to what I was saying. It kind of looks a little more like a multi-sig um, mm -hmm. because there you just, again, it's just kind of more address-based. And also, so we actually kind of going back, I guess, like to that, structure kind of like multi-sig. I, I gave the example of, you know, like an early team, core team starting with that kind of like more multi-sig approach and then expanding to a DAO. I also think that multi-sig is also really great for like a sub-DAO or maybe like a committee or work stream within a larger DAO. Um, so that way, um, you know, let's say, I don't know, again, like this is, I'm just gonna use DeFi because it's easier. Uh, maybe for DeFi, you, you want like, you want a group of dev, you know, devs like working on something, right? So maybe the community can like elect who the, those devs are and then they can form a sub DAO that kind of, that's, that's just governed by their addresses, right? So it's only them who can really kind of control it. Then send, the main DAO can send that sub DAO some funds um, to maybe then work on um, actually developing any sort of like smart contracts or any sort of up protocol upgrades that, that need to get done. And that way um, that's, and that sub DAO can like operate much more efficiently because you know, you're not trying to like, have potentially thousands of people vote on a proposal, uh, they can just do things more quickly and have their voting rules be much more short, like much shorter as soon as like, you know, if it's like nine people, as soon as five people vote for something, that's it, like it goes, you can just execute whatever, whatever it is um, and just be way more operationally efficient. Do you, do you foresee some of the partnerships that you were talking about, like with Gamma and being able to uh, create your own NFT project and, and within the workflow, go ahead and uh, create like a stacker DAO to to uh, manage the governance of your communities, and and possibly like initiate a, a console DAO for like the the chat feature within that community. Are there other partnerships that uh, stacker DAO gets plugged into to make it easy for people who are not technical that want to manage their communities and their, their web three um, uh, partnerships as well. Yeah. So we have, and we, we haven't, um, the last time we talked about this has been several weeks ago. So we probably need to have an update on this. We have talked to talk to Drew um, from friends about maybe some like discord um, bots that could uh, potentially kind of um, uh, integrate some of our contracts. Right. So that way, um, if you're running your, like, if you're running your community on discord, um, you could potentially like submit a proposal and vote potentially just from like discord or like it'll come up and that way you like, you know, like the wallet will come up and everything. You can just kind of like execute those transactions straight from discord. Um, and then somewhat relatedly, uh, or a little different, but just in terms of partnerships, we've, 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 we've created a partnership with this project called Dow HQ. They're like not in stack, they're just like a general kind of web three wide project. Um, and as part of our part, so, and, and they're basically like a DAO exchange. So it's a place where people can kind of go learn about different DAOs uh, and then actually on that, their platform uh, buy, token, buy tokens for those DAOs and also um, like vote or participate in governance. 
uh, strike straight from their platform. And so we really looked like we, we secured this partnership because one big thing we want is that we want like people across Web3 to get into different stacker DAOs, right? Uh, we think stacker, like all the different stacker DAOs that will end up launching will end up doing great things, like not just on stacks, but just Web3 generally. And we kind of want to create as much exposure uh, for Bitcoin DAOs across all of Web3. Um, and so we're hoping like by getting up, getting, them, getting on their platform, uh, or I guess just to back up a bit, a bit um, so any stack or DAO will be eligible to get on their platform. Um, and so not right away, but we're, we, we're, well, yeah, we, we're giving them, we're helping them some of their backend. So that way, like when certain, to like their tokens get on um, like a, a DEX. So let's say like for Megapont, right? When the Megapont token or Mega token ends, or Mega coin uh, ends up, let's say like getting on some kind of DEX, um, people will actually be able to go on DAO HQ, let's say if they're not even that involved with stacks, um, and be able to go on their platform and actually be able to like buy their tokens straight from their platform. Um, so we're, we're, we, we're helping with a lot of like that backend and integration. Um, and then eventually we will also add some of like our governance, um, in, like we'll, we'll do some governance and integration as well with them. Um, but really what we're trying to do is just try to get a lot more web, like just general web three exposure and bring it into stacks and to Bitcoin DAO specifically. Will Stacker DAO also use Stacker DAO? Yeah, so um, we actually, uh, we haven't done this yet, but like actually probably next week, uh, we're going to use it. We're probably just going to use it as an internal multi-sig. Um, and then we also, um, we, we've talked about this and I, I, I still think it's a little wait, time away, but I think we will end up potentially, or not potentially, I think most likely, I think we'll end up generating certain DAOs um, for, certain, for certain things as they make sense. I don't want to get into like, what exactly because it's a lot of it's still internal and like i don't want to like uh say, get way too ahead of myself um but there are certain use cases there's like especially two that come to mind where we think it makes a lot of sense to potentially spin like basically like spin out a DAO, and we can kind of like incubate it in-house and then just like right like deploy like let it go and like you know spin it out basically um so yeah so that so i think eventually we, we will just um at the moment we're only using we're like we're probably only using ourselves just for kind of like an internal multi-sig we there was a twitter space where we had you on this was probably a month ago now and jake blockchain was there with me you and hodl stacks and there was this idea and i still think about it to this day where if you have a DAO, and i, I think about megapont and project indigo the uh, vandal and timbo they were ape holders and then they went on to create this really cool really high quality project project indigo they could have spun out from megapont dow and and megapont dow could have rewarded them say hey with, with mega coin here's mega coin go yeah. build a project indigo and and then and, and, and then project indigo probably could have used like or incorporated like Megacoin in their project. So maybe you like vote or no, do something with Megacoin in their, in their thing. Yeah, I know that, that, that I, I actually think I missed that part. If that was said in the project, in the, in that, in that spaces, but that's, that's actually a brilliant idea or. No, 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 it, it now, wasn't, but, it wasn't, we didn't talk yeah. about, cause Megacoin was still an idea. It, yeah. We didn't know when it was going to happen, but now that it's real, I, I think about that example a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, I, that's a, a, a really good example. And I think that's an example where, right, like a team can just form kind of like a sub DAO, as I was, as I was mentioning, and then kind of like submit a proposal. Um, and there, that sub DAO could have just been like Project Indigo. Um, and then let's say to make a pawn for the proposal, they could have sent them mega coins to help fund their development. Um, they would develop Project Indigo, and maybe if Project Indigo then want to form a full fledged DAO, kind of as what we were getting to before, they could then do so by basically just like enabling like one or two extensions and disabling um, their like kind of like whitelisted address extension. Um, all like, and all this could be done with Stacker DAOs or on Stacker DAOs. Yeah, I, I see that as a huge potential because I know uh, Zero Authority, we'd love to do that and fund like some creator. Uh, to go create their own type of content or their own kind of DAOs too. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to, to see what you guys end up doing as well uh, with the Zero Authority DAO. Yeah, we're we're gonna need your help here, so I'm I'm excited to 
to see it come together too. What advice would you have for people looking to come to the accelerator? What has been your ex- experience within the accelerator? Uh, it's been great. Um, you know, and I think it's especially helpful for me as a first time founder, um, especially because, so I was be- be- before kind of quitting my, my last job and joining Sacred Labs full time. I worked at this law firm called Gunnish and Detmer, which is actually uh, the law firm that's represented the most venture capital um, like ever, or, or, or the most venture capital every year since that, since that uh, metric's been, been recorded. Um, so like literally my job, like very, and all, all the firm does is represent VC firms and startups. So all I did was represent startups and VCs. Um, and even with that experience, um, I think like, trying to fundraise is just a completely different experience, right? Like that I think unless you're a previous founder or maybe if you were a VC yourself, or maybe if you like just maybe were like the, the second or third employee at a startup, you just won't know. Or like, there's just a lot of like inside baseball that you just, there's just no way for you to know. Um, and so I think that probably one of the, been the, one of the biggest value uh, add of like of doing the accelerators it's kind of like learning how to navigate that process which is the first time founder uh, and the other thing is they end up connecting you with just a bunch of great people um, also the cohort is great so you end up kind of like you know creating a fellowship with a lot of these different projects that are in your cohort um, and just kind of creating partnerships with all these different projects so it just it kind of gives you a lot more exposure to a lot of different people who are building an ecosystem and it's kind of cool like we're all kind of like growing together um, so it's kind of like this like class right well like, I guess it's cohort um, but it's just a pretty, pretty cool experience, uh, I would say. So, yeah. What advice would you have for others who are, are thinking about joining the Stacks Accelerator? I guess two things. I would say um, the first thing is, um, and I guess it depends what stage you're at, but I, here I'm just going to go with maybe people that are just like, maybe they want to build something. They don't know what to build, right? Um, I would say number one is to, um, you know, you're in the ecosystem yourself, right? Um, or if you're not that in the that too deep in the ecosystem, I would recommend you to get to like try to go really deep into the ecosystem, um, and that way you can really just see like where are the pain points, right? So kind of just going back to how like we found me and Ryan kind of ended up um, like deciding on what to do for Sacred Dow Labs. Uh, it was something like we want basically we want to form a DAO, right? And there was no way to do so, and we were like, that's it, that's what we're gonna build, right? And so I think if you are like really involved in the ecosystem you like these pain points will just slap you in the face right um like like, and like you're very involved in the ecosystem right so like you know like where these pain points are and i think you will very easily find this pro like where the problem lies um and then you know just then like like, it won't be hard to find a problem so that way you can then just like figure out what the solution like figure out some kind of and build some kind of solution for that problem um so i think that's that's number one the second thing, which frankly we didn't do, um, and in hindsight, I kind of wish we did, is I would probably um, ship as quick as you can um, and just be like careful about it, right? Like don't, if, if, if you're like having tested something out yet, yeah, like you do run some tests, um, but you don't need the, necessarily the best interface. You don't need the best like partnership. Like, so, you know, we're launching with Megapont, which is awesome, right? Um, but because of that, it's like, we basically have to be like much more ready for game day. If, if that makes sense. And like, had it been a situation where maybe we were launching with like a much smaller project or maybe just like launch our own NFT project and make that like the DAO uh, or make that kind of like our, our launch. Right. Um, and that way we could have kind of gained some traction a lot more quickly. Um, and so that's, I guess the second thing is like just ship. Um, and like, I know every, a lot of people are perfectionists. I know that, um, you know, everyone wants to like put their best foot forward. Um, but kind of going back to how there's so many pain points in the ecosystem, if you can just provide something, um, that, that solves or alleviates some of this pain, even if it's not perfect yet. Um, I think we have a very forgiving and open-minded community. Um, like, like for example, like look at like Gamma, right? Sax NFT started as just like a little thing where you can like view your NFTs and Jamil like slowly expanded it. Um, and every, you know, like, and everyone loved it. Right. So you don't need to kind of come out with like the best thing possible. Like if you have an idea, you kind of quickly bust out an MVP. I would say just do that ASAP. Um, and then you can kind of iterate. You can find out if there's actually like no product market fit for that, um, for, for your, for your initial product. And, and you can quickly pivot instead of kind of like, instead of like focusing so much on this perfect initial product that, you know, maybe 
doesn't end up like being what people want, you know? So th- th- I guess those would be my two pieces, my two pieces of advice, like figure out like the pain ecosystem. And if you can't figure it out, just get deeply in the ecosystem and they'll slap you in the face and two, just shit. <laughs>